Welcome everyone. My name is Megan Carpenter and I'm Dean of the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to this special event presented by UNH Franklin Pierce Law Center's Warren B. Rudman Center and the Concord Coalition. The Rudman Center provides different types of support to students, financial support, curricular support, and experiential learning support through internships and externships. And that's for law students who are interested in a career in public service, in giving back. And we provide a lot of public programming that aligns with this mission. The Concord Coalition is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, grassroots organization that educates on the importance of responsible federal fiscal policy. Each year, the Rudman Center presents programming related to federal fiscal policy, deficit spending, economic growth, and public budgeting. In doing so, we often have the, part, the pleasure of partnering with the Concord Coalition. Tonight's program features two nationally recognized public policy experts who are going to discuss the government's role in our economy as we move past the pandemic. I can't imagine a more timely topic for this evening. I am so pleased that tonight's event is sponsored by a generous grant from the Peter Peterson Foundation. The foundation's support for us allows us to honor Senator Warren Rudman's deep commitment to responsible stewardship by supporting student scholarships, student fiscal policy work, and public programs, just like tonight's event. We are so grateful to the Peterson Foundation's generosity, to the Redmond Center, um, and to our school. Please know that tonight's event is being recorded. And what I'd like to do now is to introduce Bob Bixby. Bob Bixby is executive director of the Concord Coalition and a member of our Redmond Center Advisory Board. Bob is gonna tell you a little more about the Concord Coalition and its 30th anniversary and the program we have in store for you tonight. Bob Bixby, off to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Carpenter, and thanks to the Redmond Center for hosting this program. I can't believe it, but it's been 30 years since the Concord Coalition was founded by former Senator Warren Rudman and uh, Pete Peterson and uh, Paul Songa. So I guess it's appropriate that we're doing an event uh, at the Rudman Center sponsored by the Peterson Foundation. Um, there have been a lot of ups and downs on the budget over the last 30 years, uh, but the Concord Coalition has always been focused on long-term fiscal sustainability and economic growth. In the last couple of years, that's been particularly difficult to do because of the pandemic and the needs to respond immediately to a, an urgent crisis. And who knows, we may be having another uh, a big event coming up uh, with the European war. We don't, we don't know. But so it makes it difficult sometimes to uh, think about long-term issues. Uh, and yet it is the, uh, the long-term issues that are really, really important. So as we come out of the pandemic, uh, it's important for policymakers to, to shift to looking at some of the underlying structural deficits that, uh, and I, I don't just mean budget deficits, but some of the things that lead to projections of uh, slow economic growth and unsustainable debt. Uh, there are many different, uh, pro you know, people have different ideas, Democrats and Republicans are gonna have different ideas about how to do that. But it's important that we begin, uh, begin looking at those issues because Going into the pandemic, we were already on an unsustainable course and we already had projected very slow economic growth. So we're gonna have uh, two experts tonight uh, looking at that subject from, uh, they may have some different perspectives on it and we hope that we get some, some Q and A's. We're also very, very fortunate uh, tonight to have as our moderator, Laura Canoy. Uh, Laura is well known to Granite Staters as the uh, longtime host of the exchange program on New Hampshire Public Radio, uh, where she interviewed uh, many presidential candidates and gubernatorial candidates and governors and senators and city councilmen, as well as writers and, uh, you know, artists and cultural leaders. Uh, the exchange was uh, just a, a phenomenal program. Laura stepped down uh, 
uh, I believe it was last year from uh, hosting that program. And I guess I just couldn't find a replacement. Nobody could do it any better, Laura. So I guess that just ended the program. Uh, we are uh, very, very fortunate, though, that she still does uh, guest speaking and moderates events uh, like tonight's events. And we're very, very pleased uh, that she is the uh, moderator for tonight's event. And so, Laura, I, uh, the floor is yours. Well, Bob, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And it's really great to be here. And let me say happy 30th birthday to the Concord Coalition. So our event tonight is a civil exchange of ideas. It's a discussion, as Bob said, not a debate. So there won't be specific time limits for answers. However, as moderator, I'll make sure that the audience has a chance to hear from both panelists and to get their questions in. Let me introduce our panelists now. They are Wendy Edelberg. She's director of the Hamilton Project at the Brookings Institution, where she's also a senior fellow in economic studies. Before joining Brookings, she was the chief economist at the Congressional Budget Office. Wendy, thank you very much for being here. It's a real pleasure. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Also joining us, Brian Riedel. He's the budget and tax guy at the Manhattan Institute, where he writes about budgets, spending, taxes, and the economy. And Brian, really nice to have you along as well. Thank you. Glad to be here. And we really do want to hear from our audience, your questions about government spending, and this whole notion of whether you think views about government spending have changed since the pandemic. Submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the call window, and please tell us where you're joining us from as well. It'd be nice to hear that. We really encourage your input. Also, this webinar is being recorded. Excerpts from today will be broadcast next Wednesday, March 16th, from 3 to 4 p.m. on WKXL Radio right here in Concord, New Hampshire. Also, video and audio from the entire webinar will be available online at concordcoalition.org. Well, all that being said, Wendy and Brian, let's begin. There's so much to talk about. And with so much attention on Ukraine right now and U.S. military policy, we will definitely cover the fiscal repercussions there. But as you both know, defense spending is just part of a much bigger fiscal picture. So let's really start with that. Here we are, 30th anniversary of the Concord Coalition, the nation 30 trillion in debt. That is a hard number for me to wrap my head around. It just sounds enormous. Wendy, to you first, please put that into context for us. What's the bigger picture that surrounds this one 30 trillion debt statistic? So, so first, it's even the complication of figuring out which which debt number you should care about, and the the amount of debt that's actually held by the public that's not held by different parts of the federal government, uh, where it's like a wife lending money to her husband or a husband lending money to her wife, his wife um, is twenty trillion. But I don't know that twenty trillion is much more meaningful, or twenty one trillion is much more meaningful than thirty trillion. So it's. The easiest way to think about how big of a deal that is, is how hard it is to finance, what our net interest costs are. And there, net interest as a share of GDP right now is about one and a half percent. That is actually lower than it was in any year between 1980 and 2000, those, that 20 year period. So it's a really big number when you think about the total amount of debt, but the cost of actually financing it right now is pretty modest compared to the size of the economy. Could you give us that too, Wendy? Because I often hear the debt described as a share of the economy. And right. I think that gives listeners a sense also of how big it is, how worrisome it might be. So give us that too, please. Uh, so as a share of GDP right now, debt is about a hundred percent. But but let's be clear, there's nothing particularly magical about debt as a share of GDP. Is it less than a hundred? Is it more than a hundred? It, it's really just a way of gauging how big debt is relative to the share of the economy. Since you know the economy is growing over time, it's quite reasonable that you would think that the amount of debt should be growing over time. So it's a useful measure to see, is it growing faster or more slowly than the overall economy. So for example, we know that debt as a share of GDP in our projections under current law is going to move sideways for a little while. And then over the long term, spending is going to outpace revenues and debt as a share of GDP is projected to rise. 
that's where we get the angst of this feels unsustainable. I see. Yeah. So Brian, how about you? How do you put this big, big number, whether as Wendy mm -hmm. said, it's 20 trillion or 30 trillion, how do you put that into context for folks and, and make it real? Yeah, I mean, I, the number that I use that I think is a better number is $23 trillion, which is the debt if you subtract like trust fund debt, which is money, money that wasn't actually borrowed from the economy, but is kind of the government like collecting taxes and then lending it to itself. So I use about $23 trillion as the most relevant number in terms of the economy. To put that in terms regular people can understand, it comes to about $177,000 per household. Now, that's a scary number, although I want to assure most households, you're not going to be paying back the full $177,000 per household. We're really not going to pay back the debt, but you are on hook for the interest on the debt. Um, in terms of putting the debt in its context, it was 100% of the economy at the peak of World War II. Then it dropped to about 23% of the economy by the mid 70s and was still only about 40% of the economy before the Great Recession started. It has since spiked from 40 to 100% of the economy um, just since the Great Recession started in 2008. And if you count state and local government uh, debt, it's actually closer to about 160% of the economy. That's bigger than most countries. I think Japan is bigger. Uh, uh, Italy and Greece are bigger, but not that's about it. And the danger moving forward is while the debt is 100% of GDP right now at the federal level, we have these huge imbalances moving forward in the baseline that are projected. And so according to the Congressional Budget Office, we're going to go to about 200% of GDP in the next 30 years. And that's the baseline projection. So that doesn't take into account additional tax cuts, additional spending. If you just kind of keep today's government on autopilot, you'll go to about 200% of GDP. And that's what economists debate is how big of a debt, what share of GDP becomes really dangerous and bad for the economy. Well, sure. So let's talk about that. And Brian, since you raised it, you first, I mean, on a scale of one to 10, um, with 10 being this is going to sink us tomorrow and one being this debt is nothing to lose sleep over. I mean, Brian, where do you put it on your, your worry scale? I'm going to give you a two part answer. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say <laughs> in the short term, it's a two or a three. The debt right now isn't really holding the economy back too much. There are some studies that do show that when the debt exceeds 80% of GDP in most developed countries, you do get a slight reduction in economic growth, but I don't think it's huge. I don't think right now it's holding us back too much, in part because also interest rates are low right now. Over the long term, though, when we talk about the 200% of GDP projection, the fact that the baseline deficits are $112 trillion over the next 30 years, and that if interest rates rise more, that could go bigger. I would say over the long period, I would say it's a nine or a 10 over a 30 to 40 year period. But in the short term right now, I would say it's a two or a three because it hasn't grown that big yet and interest rates haven't risen yet. Sure. So lots for an economist to lose sleep over in the long term. How about you, Wendy? Can you put the, the debt on your sort of um, one to 10 worry scale for us? So qualitatively, I, I very much agree with everything Brian said. I think that uh, right now it's not much of a concern because the interest rates are very low. Um, and, and the particular interest rate that, that we should pay attention to that's low is the 10-year treasury yield. What's interesting about that is that those are people who are willing to lend to the federal government, uh, locking in rates for the next 10 years. And they are willing to do that right now at 2%, actually lower than before the pandemic. Wow. So financial markets are telling us not to worry. Now, what it means for over the longer term, um, it's, it's, it's hard to know when it becomes a, a really big deal. I fully, I fully believe that more federal borrowing increases interest rates and lowers GDP all else equal. I'm completely on board with that modeling and those empirical results but the effects aren't very big. So like CBO did an analysis uh, looking at 
what if instead of, they did this in 2019, what if instead of debt as a share of GDP rising by 20 percentage points over a 15 year period, instead it fell by 40 percentage points over that same 15 year period. That is a huge reduction in debt as a share of GDP. That would be massive increases in revenues or reductions in spending or both. What that would do to GDP at the end of that 15 year period is raise it by less than 4% relative to current law. Can both Doesn't move the needle a lot. These are small effects. So the only time that you have to really start worrying about the debt is for these like nonlinear, scary fiscal crisis effects. That's where you start to worry. Well, and just putting it in the real layperson um, experience, and Wendy, I'll go to you first on this, but Brian, I want to hear from you too, of course. So just break it down for me, please, Wendy. Let's say I run my own business, things are going well, you know, my profits are good, my sales are good. How does a large federal debt really hurt me and by extension, the wider economy? Like what are the factors that, that we're looking at here in terms of economic prosperity? There are two main ways that, uh, that the federal debt affects the economy. One is that it boosts interest rates. Not a lot, but a little bit. So interest so rates are higher. For business to take out loans. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Interest rates are a little higher than they would be otherwise if we didn't have this massive federal debt and deficits. That's number one. Number two, to the extent that we're borrowing from abroad, we are paying that interest to overseas investors. So that's stuff that we're making here and we are sending it overseas to partly pay off our debt. Um, so those are the two ways in which the federal in, in which federal borrowing actually reduces our standard of living here in the United States. But again, it's not huge. These are pretty small numbers in terms of the overall economic effects relative to how rich we are as a country. How about you, Brian? Anything to add to that to really just put it down to the, the granular sure. level of you know, we hear these numbers, 20 trillion, 30 trillion in debt, but if my business is going well, is that really going to hurt me? Um, not directly in the short term. I, I agree with Wendy. I think, you know, kind of piggybacking on, on, on much of what Wendy said, I think in the short term, it, 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 it can raise interest rates marginally. Right now, interest rates are low because other factors have been offsetting the effect of debt. It's not that debt doesn't raise interest rates. It's that we've had things like low productivity and demographics offsetting it, at least for now. Um, but, you know, all else equal, it can raise interest rates, it can reduce investment. And backing up the point about how you're sending money overseas, um, the Congressional Budget Office estimated about a year ago that under their baseline debt scenario, um, the per capita GNP in 2050 will be $6,300 lower than otherwise that year. Now the GNP accounts for money staying in America versus going overseas to pay others, $6,300 per person. But I think there's maybe a bigger way that if I'm a business owner, I should be concerned. And that is debt and interest payments represent future interest costs that have to be paid through higher taxes, lower benefits, or if we go in this direction, inflation. Because at a certain point, if you believe the debt's gonna grow at a certain point where interest costs are gonna become a, a bigger part of the budget as CBO projects, you're gonna have to shift a lot more federal resources into paying those interest costs. And again, that's gonna come out of either your, your lower tax burden or it's gonna come out of your benefits or it just could end up inflation. So I think if I'm, if I'm a business owner, I'm concerned about making sure I have money set aside in the future to pay some of those interest costs if rates combine with the bigger debt. That's interesting. And both of you have used, you know, the, the long-term scenario and talking about how that sometimes gives a, a, different, um, a different idea around how concerned we should be about the debt. And I wanna ask both of you, since we are here at the 30th anniversary of the Concord Coalition, when the coalition was created 30 years ago, the founders warned that the debt would reduce our nation's ability to compete and innovate. The debt was even called a cancer that was metastasizing across our country. So that was 30 years ago again. And yet over that time, the U.S. economy has seen incredible growth, amazing innovation. So, Wendy, what do you think? How do we how should we view those 
kind of dire predictions from 30 years ago today? We've learned two things. We have learned that uh, interest rates are a lot lower than we projected they would be. So whatever concerns we had about the cost of financing federal borrowing, we should have fewer concerns than we did before. So that's one thing that we've learned. The other thing that we've learned is that uh, as much as we might have been worried about a fiscal crisis, and I really want to distinguish that from these sort of normal grinding day in and day out effects of federal debt increasing interest rates a little bit, um, a fiscal crisis is a really scary possibility. So when countries um, all of a sudden abruptly face much higher interest rates or see big reductions in the value of their currency because investors no longer want to lend to them, that can really reduce standards of living and, and, and be quite painful. And I think there was a lot of worry over many decades that the US could face that kind of crisis. And it has turned out that investors really have stuck with us. And uh, I think when all said and done, a, a lot of those fears were overblown. Well, that's interesting. And Brian, I definitely want to bring you in on that as well. Were those predictions 30 years ago that this was going to, you know, become a cancer in our economy, quote unquote, was that too dire? Were there other factors that we weren't thinking about back then? Yeah, there, there's a couple things that happened. I think first, we actually did pretty well from 1992 through about 2008. I mean, we ran budget surpluses in the late 1990s. Uh, you know, the Cold War ended. We had a revenue bubble, you know, in part because of the work of the Concord Coalition. There were a lot of, like in the 1990s, we didn't do a lot of huge new expensive initiatives. Lawmakers were responsible. They weren't piling on a lot of new new uh, expensive initiatives. And we did keep the debt somewhat manageable. Like I said, it was 40% of GDP before the Great Recession. And I think Concord gets, some co uh, gets, gets a lot of uh, credit for stopping politicians from doing crazy things during that period. Um, I think... Interest rates have helped us too. The way I look at low interest rates is they bought us about a 10 or 15 year buffer. And what I mean by that is the debt is gonna grow to a certain point. If you look at the 30, 40 or 50 projections, the debt is gonna grow to a certain level where even low interest rates can't really save you. When you're running deficits of 12, 13, 14, 15% of GDP per year, even low interest rates aren't gonna save you. But what it did mean is that it, it's not going to hit us that hard until the debt gets higher. So instead of a debt of 120% of GDP being the point where we're getting hit hard, it's going to be closer to 180 or 200% of GDP where we're getting hit hard. In a way, the low interest rates bought us some time. It bought us some space that it's not going to hit us until we hit get a higher uh, debt level. That being said, the danger was always the retiring baby boomers, and that's happening right now. The boomers retire between 2008 and 2030. So it's really, that's always been the time period where a lot of the costs are going to get locked in, the retirement of the baby boomers and after. So I, I fear the worst is yet to come as those, those entitlement costs get locked in. Well, a reminder for everyone watching and listening, we really want to hear from you. How do you see public views around the role of government spending changing two years since the pandemic began? Do we think about debt and deficits differently than we did two years ago? Is that change for the better or not? Again, you can submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the call window. Now tell us where you're listening and watching from as well. We'd love to hear that. And we really encourage you to join us. Again, submit those questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the call window. Well, Wendy and Brian, and Wendy, you first, just briefly, I did want to talk a little bit about military spending because as Bob Bixby alluded to, you know, there's a lot of attention in Ukraine right now, how the US military might respond. You are both fiscal analysts, not military analysts, but I did want to ask you about the fiscal repercussions um, there. So Wendy, you know, again, respecting your expertise, what about the military spending in general? How much of a chunk does it take out of the federal budget? Oh, 
Um, uh, Brian, Brian's going to know these numbers. I bet Brian knows these numbers right off the top of his head. Uh, <laughs> I want to say 600 billion and it's, I, but it's, I, oh, you've caught me off guard. That's okay. There's a lot of numbers, Wendy. It's really, all right. Uh, Brian, do you want to jump in there or? Sure. The, the defense budget is about 3.4% of GDP. Um, a, Wait, but I mean, how much, was I right? Is it, is it, am I in the ballpark? It's about 700 billion. Whew. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're you're you're, 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 you're a very good. Go Actually, if you don't count Oko, I think you were right on it. If you if you, if you just take <laughs> out Oko, I, I think a good way of thinking about defense is it's about fifteen percent of federal spending. It's actually been declining. It was half of the budget under JFK, and it's gradually declined to about fifteen percent of the budget, and it's projected to fall to ten percent of the budget over the next uh, three decades. Um, not because it's not, it is rising. It's just not going to rise as fast as other parts of the budget and the projections. Now, granted, oh, things can change. Um, you know, we we could go on a huge defense spending spree. The baseline is that it's going to drop from about fifteen to ten percent of the budget. Although, you know, one one response to Ukraine might be NATO building up their military, like Germany's already announced, which could actually, in the long term, reduce the pressure on our military. Maybe if if Europe becomes more aggressive. So, it's tough to predict. Oh, that's really so, interesting. Yeah, go ahead, Wendy. Love your thoughts there too. Yeah, but I, but I, I will jump in with the with the one thing that that I have thought about uh, with regards to the conflict in Ukraine, which is this the 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 primary way that it's going to affect the U.S. economy and, in fact, the fiscal situation of the U.S. Uh, you know the United States is not through defense spending. It's through what's going to happen to oil prices and what's going to happen to gasoline mm -hmm. prices and energy prices more broadly. Uh, we are in for a significant spike in energy inflation. And that's going to be a challenge for the US economy. Yeah, I'm really glad you raised that point. And you know, really? on a personal note, my one of my sons just started working for DoorDash. And <laughs> already we're thinking, okay, there's some gasoline costs there that we're gonna have to start factoring in. So yeah, that's a really great point. I also wonder about just general uncertainty and how that makes you know investors Feel. But we'll set that aside for now. I'm really happy to let both of you know that we have some questions coming in from our audience. So that's great. We'll go to those now. And um, Lisa asks, how did the 2017 Trump tax cuts impact the long term fiscal forecast for meeting our obligations? Lisa says, aren't they a huge part of the deficit and therefore increase the debt? Lisa, great question. Brian, I'm going to go to you first on that. Sure. The, the Trump tax cuts. Um, well, first off, I'm, I'm going to assume that they get extended. Um, they were written that a lot of it is set to expire at the end of 2025. It's probably not going to expire if history is any guide. The long-term effect of the Trump tax cuts, by my estimate, is to cut revenues by about 0.8% of GDP. So historically, they've been about 173 They're actually were projected to go up to about 18.1 over the next 30 years. This would if they're extended, this would keep them back down at 17.3. So you're going to get about 0.8% of GDP in lower revenues. Um, it's it's not a major driver. You're going to have Social Security and Medicare costs rising by about 6% of GDP, but it is part of it. And that 0.8% of GDP absolutely contributes. And if you keep those tax cuts, it does mean you're going to have to find 8%, 0.8% .8 of GDP and savings elsewhere in order to keep the debt at the same level. So it's not the primary driver. Social Security, Medicare, and even Medicaid are much bigger drivers. But at a long-term cost of 0.8% of GDP plus interest, which actually probably bumps it up closer to 1.1, 1.2, it is a contributing factor, absolutely. Oh, that's interesting. Wendy, thoughts on the uh, Trump tax, cut, tax cuts and their role? So, so sticking with what, what Brian said about, about the possibility that they get extended, because the world looks very different if they don't get it, if the tax cuts don't get extended. Yeah, it went in the wrong direction. And uh, in terms of in, in terms of fiscal sustainability. And then you want to ask the question, well, then what did we get for it? So, you know, when you worry about fiscal sustainability, thinking about Social Security, thinking about federal health care spending, you think, well, what do we get for that? Well, we get the Social Security system, which is incredibly beneficial. Official. We get, uh, you know, broader access to health insurance coverage, which is very beneficial. So then you want to ask, well, what did we get for the tax cuts? And they were they were explained as a as a way to boost overall economic growth. And um, 
all the analysis I've seen and all of the results that I've seen in the data suggests that the economic growth, if it's there, if the positive economic growth is there, it's gotten lost in the noise. That's interesting, Wendy. So you're saying don't just look at spending, look at the benefits that you get from that spending. So for example, Medicare and Medicaid, yes, it's expensive, but it also means people are healthier and that's to the economic and societal. Society Absolutely. Seems to be a broader point. I would love lower taxes too. I would love my taxes to be zero, but <laughs> I get a lot of value from federal spending. I think federal spending does an enormous good and I think we should pay for it. I'm going to ask both of you about pandemic spending in just a moment, but I'm thrilled that we have so many great questions from our audience. So let's go back to them. And uh, William asks, is there any possibility that modern monetary theory is correct? William, thank you for the question. And I admit I have a minor in economics. I don't know what modern monetary theory is. Wendy, can you enlighten me? Uh, so modern monetary theory, I find very slippery. Uh, because it, depending on who you're talking to and what time of day it is, it can be different things. The one form of modern monetary theory that I think has some logical sense to it is that uh, we, it, it argues that it wants, I'm going to try to make this make sense. It wants monetary policymakers to be completely passive and it wants fiscal policymakers to basically fine tune policy from year to year in a way that is best for economic growth and is best for inflation. So it basically takes all the power away from the monetary policymakers and it says we're going to rely on fiscal policymakers to make sure that inflation doesn't get out of control and to make sure that the unemployment rate uh, you know, stays close to its lowest attainable level. So oh. that holds some logic to it. If you believe that fiscal policymakers really can act so nimbly and fine tune policy on a year to year basis, which I don't think is the appropriate role of fiscal policymakers. Um, so I don't think modern monetary theory works. You know, it's, it's not a new theory. That's so really first, let me just say, it is not, a, let me, I should have started by saying that. In its <laughs> most logical form, it's not a new theory. It's using all the same identities we have. It's just explaining them from the left side instead of the right side, basically. So kind and, of getting rid of the Federal Reserve, it sounds like. Yes, it's making the Federal Reserve passive. Interesting. And Brian, what do you think? Modern monetary theory. William, thank you for enlightening me. I had not heard it's of that. MMT is a very trendy topic in some corners. I will say um, most economists the vast majority of economists remain pretty unpersuasive. MMT essentially says that we can pay off debt and new spending with the printing press in a roundabout way, that if we just keep printing money, it won't actually cause inflation because output will rise accordingly. So you won't have more money chasing fewer goods. You'll actually have more goods and you won't get inflation. I think the history of, of inflation, if you just look at around globally and in America, suggests that this is probably not very persuasive, that if you if you really are going to expand the money supply that much to pay for government spending, to pay back old expenses, you're probably going to get inflation, and, and in fact, significant inflation. I mean, you look at $112 trillion in baseline deficits, that's a lot of, that's a lot of new money to print over the next 30 years, plus all the new stuff they want to do. Wow. And then to back up what Wendy just said, the idea is if the economy does overheat with inflation, you just raise taxes to pull the money out. Well, that leads to a political question. If there's inflation and people are having problems and they can't keep up, kind of like what we're seeing on a limited degree right now, the economy is in danger, there's inflation, people are nervous. Is that really the time Congress is probably going to raise taxes? Probably, Probably not. not. I don't yeah. think members of Congress are going to do that. And so that's why central banks are usually independent, because Congress isn't going to raise taxes to pull the money out during times when the economy is fragile. Well, Lisa, William, thank you. Great questions. And a reminder to everybody, you can submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the call window. Tell us where you're listening from as well. We'd love to hear that. And we really encourage you to join us. And Wendy and Brian, let's go to another audience question. This is great. And um, an anonymous attendee asks, do the Social Security trust funds factor into any of this? Now, that's a huge question. And maybe another day we could talk all just about Social Security. But go ahead, Brian, since you mentioned Social Security, uh, you first. 
maybe so, the question would be, how do the Social Security trust funds factor into this? Because they, they clearly do, right, Brian? So essentially, from 1983 to 2009, Social Security ran a $3 trillion surplus. But instead of saving it, the government essentially just spent the surplus and promised to pay itself back later. Um, this, the Social Security Trust Fund is very important from a legal basis. It is a promise that Social Security's first $3 trillion in deficits will be repaid by general revenues. So legally, it's important. Economically, it's not very important because the, the money is gone. And it's going to have to be repaid with new taxes, spending cuts, or borrowing. So that means it doesn't actually save us any money going forward. We're still going to have to find new, new money sources to pay for all the Social Security benefits. So it's, it's legally important, but economically, it doesn't really save future taxpayers from having to pay the full cost of Social Security. Oh, because it's gone, Brian? Do I have that right? Yeah, it was spent. It's just that there's just it's just IOUs. It's a promise to pay it back out of future taxes or future spending cuts or future borrowing. Legally, it's promised, and that's why seniors should have some peace of mind. But economically, it's IOUs. Well, wow, Wendy, how do you view it? It's a really good question about Social Security. I'm glad this person raised it. So the, the trust fund is, in, is confusing, and I think it's actually more confusing than it's worthwhile to really dwell on. The way I think about it is that we had a social security program for many decades that brought in revenues and gave out benefits. And for a lot of decades, and it was bringing in more revenue than it was giving out in benefits. And that, that was great. That was a good part. I mean, that was just, that was an aspect of the system. And going forward, um, it's going to pay out more in benefits than it's bringing in in revenues. And that's largely a demographic issue. People live um, longer. Well, but also, it, it, and also it's population growth and it's sure. immigration and, and, and it's people living longer. Um, so it's, it's, yes, there's a trust fund and then there's this whole accounting issue, but the crux of it is for a long time, we had a program that brought in more revenues than it gave out in benefits. And that basically allowed us to, it was a source of revenue, basically. It was a net source of revenue. And going forward, we're going to have a program where it's bringing in less in revenue than it's giving out in benefits. That's that's no different from the fact that like we're spending money on defense. We're spending money on non-defense discretionary spending. We're spending money on health care. We're spending money on social security benefits. It's it's the, the fact that we're obsessed with, yes, but how much are we giving out in social security benefits relative to what are we bringing in in revenues in social security? That is, um, that's more of a political question. Well, and again, I wanna encourage people to submit their questions in that Q&A function at the bottom of the call window. And I'll go back to a couple more audience questions in just a moment, but I don't wanna to go too much further, Wendy and Brian, asking you really one of the biggest questions of this evening, and that is the pandemic. I mean, here we are, you know, two years, Hopefully we're coming out of this. Um, how much do you think, Brian, the pandemic has contributed to this 30 trillion or 20 trillion in debt that uh, we're talking about? What role has the pandemic played? Yeah, I mean, I've been actually, the topic I've been working on a lot this week for a report is, is working on the cost of all of this. So far, pan, the pandemic in terms of the budgetary cost has been, depending on what you really count as legitimately pandemic or not, about four to four to five trillion dollars in total legislation cumulatively resulting from the pandemic, broadly, very broadly using pandemic legislation, about four to five trillion. Now, you could argue though that even if we hadn't paid these costs, had the government not responded so forcefully for the pandemic, we would have had a lot more economic costs, which would have in turn reduced tax revenues. So in a certain some way, we spent a lot of money and we went into a lot of debt in order to keep the economy afloat and prevent that from adding not only pain to families, but more debt as well. So there was, it did contribute to the debt. It was somewhat unavoidable. You can either pay the debt directly with legislation or have the debt grow indirectly by having the economy sink faller and or sink more and, and lose tax revenues. 
Wow, Brian, so it sounds like you think that a lot of the pandemic related spending was was worthwhile. It kept the economy going and by extension, you know, kept families out of pain and kept some tax revenue coming in. There was a lot that I, I thought was excessive. I think I think some of the stuff in the American Rescue Plan um, was probably beyond what we needed. I think we gave, you know, $350 billion to state and local governments when they were running surpluses. But th those are more quibbles in the grand scheme of the four to five trillion, you know, the vast majority of it, I think, was about keeping families and businesses whole when they were essentially shut down, which was fully justified. So, Wendy, how do you think all these pandemic related programs that we saw and, you know, as Brian is describing, many of them having strong support, even from fiscal conservatives, how do you think these programs have overall changed Americans' views about the role of government spending? Well, that's interesting. I mean, it's hard. I, I, I think I would I would just be guessing. And I think the reason the reason it's hard to know is because our views towards government right now, I mean, I'm reading the papers just like you are, our views towards government are so conflated with everyone's frustration with the pandemic. Mm. Um, and um, you know, if the government can't solve the pandemic, like that's incredibly frustrating, and 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 obviously now the the frustration with inflation. So um, if like I can tell you personally, I think that it was an extraordinary what 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 Congress did in March 2020 was an extraordinary achievement, and it actually gave me a lot of optimism about what Congress could do uh, come the next crisis. Um, but I am not sure that people have walked, I'm not sure that people right now are feeling particularly good about anything happening in the economy or the political system because they are rightly quite frustrated. The, and the, the other thing that I wanna say though about the effects of all of this fiscal support is I, I wanna be too, I wanna be cautious about thinking about it too much through the economic lens. Um, a lot of the fiscal support was was good at alleviating suffering and, um, and keeping families from just dire, dire financial straits and panic. And, um, and, and that, that was, that was a really good thing. So I like, I, I just want to be, I want to be careful about not like, I wouldn't want to do just a, a, a like a, I wouldn't want to do a calculation of the guys, but what what would GDP have looked like without all of the fiscal support we did? Like, well, but you know, we got we got a vaccine out, and we got a vaccine distributed, and we got you know we we spent a lot of money to like keep you know try to keep the numbers of people out of hospitals, you know keep keep people out of hospitals and keep people from dying. So I you know I think a lot of that fiscal support uh, did good outside of the economy. I wonder, and I'll ask both of you this, um, coming out of this, will there be types of spending programs, uh, Wendy, I'll go to you first, that people will say, you know, this this kind of worked during the pandemic. The fact that we gave childcare support, the fact that we gave rental assistance when people were in dire straits, the fact that we extended health insurance for some folks. I mean, will there be types of pandemic related spending that people might say, you know, th this kind of work, let's stick with it. You know, it's funny, Brian just talked about working on something that he's writing a report on. I am, I, that's the issue I'm working on. Uh, what worked well and what didn't? What do we want to repeat? Yeah, what, do, what do we want to keep in our toolkit? I think we learned a lot about effective ways to expand the unemployment insurance system, which was woefully inadequate before the pandemic. Uh, we learned a lot of ways that we should fix it, but I think that the very significant expansions of who is eligible for UI, I think that worked remarkably well, um, given that we were driving driving the bus and fixing the bus at the same time. Um, the other thing that, that I think we learned about, it should have been obvious, but we learned about, is that we can, we can alleviate poverty through the social insurance system pretty directly. The, the making the child tax credit fully refundable did uh, extraordinary good in reducing child poverty rates, even in the midst of an economic crisis. And, and I hope that policymakers take a lesson from that for the future. Yeah, Brian, I'd love to hear from you on this as well. And I love that both you and Wendy are working on this exact issue. I mean, what types of pandemic spending, looking back, do we think 
maybe that was a good idea or maybe we think it was you know a total waste and we shouldn't try that again what do you think brian i think what we learned i think i think moving forward we're probably going to see bigger government responses to recessions than we have in the past i think this 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 response was so huge and I, I think we're probably going to see that moving forward. I think the next time we have a recession, we're probably going to see Congress shoot a bazooka into it more than we have in the past. I think you might see things like the PPP program that subsidized businesses. You might see more things like that. Um, I think you're going to see hopefully states do a better job of updating their on insurance or their unemployment on, uh, insurance programs, as Wendy mentioned. State UI programs were really archaic in March 2020. And hopefully in the meantime, they'll actually improve that and make it better. One of my concerns though is, you know, I think we, we did spend a lot of money that did a lot of good for people, but we did it while running deficits of 15% of GDP that's not sustainable. And my, my concern is, while we can look at a lot of positive things that, that this money has done for people, we have to be cognizant moving forward that the baseline deficits are growing so big over the next 30 years that if we are going to move towards a bigger, a bigger system, a, a, a social support system, we got to find the money to pay for it. And it's going to be tough because you already have big baseline deficits to pay for too. And I do worry a little bit that we've removed the sticker shock from individuals. All of a sudden, no one, no one on, no one gets excited for anything under a trillion dollars anymore. <laughs> so it used to be 200 billion, 300 billion with a lot of money. Now you hear things like anything less than one or $2 trillion isn't worth bothering. And so I hope as we move towards possibly more government involvement in certain areas that we saw in the pandemic, that we keep an eye on what we can afford, what we can tax and the, and the burdens we have already in the baseline, because you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge. Well, let's go back to our audience. And I know there are more questions coming in. So Thomas from North Carolina asks, COVID deaths are over 950,000 with a substantial portion of deaths occurring with people over the age of 65. To what extent will this reduce the benefits such as Social Security, Medicare, pensions and reduce any deficits? Wow, Thomas, thank you for the question. I mean, do we know yet, Brian, that you know, given that this disease did kill more older people, he's right. Is that really going to have a fiscal impact? We might not know yet, but go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, we already have a lot of retired baby boomers and there's 74 million baby boomers retiring. So if you're, you know, you just assume a lot of these are individuals, you're looking at about a what, say a 1% decline in the retiree population. That, sure, that, that may save that may save some social security costs. It's also gonna mean less money being paid into the system by the people who are under 65 who passed away. So I think you'll see marginal effects, but not huge effects uh, fiscally. Did you wanna jump in on that too, Wendy? I, I do because the, 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 the one less macabre point that I think is worth making is what the pandemic did to immigration. And immigration is, is quite good for the fiscal position of the US government because um, immigrants have a much higher propensity to work uh, than the non-immigrants, um, which means they pay more in social security and they're on average younger. There's, there's lots of ways in which having, having uh, more immigrants in our population is good for our fiscal situation and good for social security. And we have a lot fewer immigrants right now than, than we did before the pandemic, and even more so relative to what we projected we would have. Oh, that's really interesting. Boy, that's a whole nother topic, but that's super interesting. And I had not thought about that, that immigrants do tend to be younger and so working, and that's injecting more, uh, more cash into the Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security systems. Here's another question from an attendee who says, would COVID era expansions to paid family leave be beneficial and feasible to continue? Um, thank you for that question. Wendy, go ahead. I think it's a great idea. Um, I think uh, we are way behind other advanced countries in terms of federal paid leave uh, benefits, whether it's sick leave or family leave. Um, the, the inequities in who has access to paid leave and who doesn't, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's really quite depressing. And um, we have a lot of evidence that paid leave is good for families, paid leave is good for children. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's better insofar as it, it, you know, it allows people to make the best choices for themselves and their families. Um, I think it worked pretty well during the, during the COVID-19 crisis. And um, I wish we figured out how to solve this problem going forward. Here's another question. This is from Matthew who says, would it help the Democrats and Republicans if each was given an allowance, say 15% of the budget each, that they could spend without negotiation with the other party? <laughs> Matthew, what a great scenario. Um, what do you think, Brian? Instead of all this fighting, if each party got 15% of the budget where they could just do what they wanted with it. You know, I, I I would need to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's a that's so it's a outside the box. Uh, you it's know, we kind of do that yeah. already when um, they do these budget deals on discretionary spending where Republicans get a huge defense increase and Democrats get an equal defense in domestic spending and they kind of trade off. Um, I'd be curious where it would go. I think I think Republicans would probably use theirs to cut taxes, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure how Democrats would use theirs. I, I would need to think about that. Yeah. Wendy, anything there? I know you guys are more fiscal analysts than political yeah, I mean, analysts, but there's, there's part of it there. Yeah, go ahead. The, the struggle is that I, I think that the, the question assumes that we know what the top line is and we're just, we know how big the pie is and we're just dividing up the pie. Mm. And part of the debate is how big the pie should be. So how much spending should we have in total? And frankly, how, how much revenue, you know, how much are we bringing in in revenues? So um, I, I think, I think they're, they're at, the questions are actually even harder. Than, yeah. than, than, than what this question suggests they are. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Matthew's question assumes that everybody agrees on how big the pie is and then says 15% to you and 15% for you, but people don't even agree how big the pie should be. But I'm right. glad he asked about politics because I did want to ask both of you this question. The, as you know, the Concord Coalition founders were a bipartisan group, including former Republican Senator Warren Rudman and Democratic Senator Paul Songus. Um, Wendy, to you first, what were the politics around debt and deficits 30 years ago, you know, Republican, Democrat, and have they changed? Oh, that re I mean, it really is just, it's a political science question. I think, um, I, I, oh, I'm sure I'm going to try to not get myself into trouble. I mean, I think part of the issue is which party has feels like it has something to prove to financial markets and uh which party thinks that they have to prove that they're fiscally responsible in order to assuage financial markets and which party thinks that uh financial markets are already pretty copacetic with whatever they're going to do and so they don't have to like jump through any hoops for them and so i think what i again this is really outside my area of expertise but i think what that means is that Democrats have often been more fiscally conservative when all said and done than Republicans. Interesting. What do you think, Brian? How would you describe sort of the, the politics of debt and deficits and whether they've changed over the past 30 well, years? I, I did a report, a fascinating report two years ago on the history of budget negotiations and grand deal, defi grand deal deficit negotiations. I did 15 case, all the 15 case studies of the 15 biggest budget uh, deficit negotiation since 1983, looking for why some succeeded and why others failed. Wow. Um, and what I, one of the things that, that struck me is how bipartisan the issue was around the time of, of the late 80s, early 90s. You had the 1990 President Bush had the, the Andrews deal where he broke his read my lips, no new taxes pledge and agreed to raise taxes. You had, you had President Clinton in 1993 leading a push for deficit reduction. Um, Senator Kerry, um, Bob Kerry, then got a deficit reduction commission out of it where he focused on entitlements. You know, lawmakers weren't that, lawmakers were really kind of more bipartisan focused on deficit reduction back then on both sides. Sure, they disagreed on how to do it. And there was probably a lot more talk in a lot of areas than actual commitment you know, to actually make the tough decisions. But it really seemed more bipartisan back then. Ross Perot was a big part of it. Uh, I remember seeing him on TV in 1992. I remember it, that and, too. The next and these days, <laughs> these days, I think neither party cares about the deficit as even remotely as much as both parties did back then. Oh, that's really interesting. You know, um, and obviously again, the Concord Coalition bipartisan group. 
when they announced the coalition at that news conference 30 years ago, Senator Songus said, the American people are ready for truth about debt and deficits. What do you think, Brian? Were they ready for quote unquote truth back then? And do they want the truth now? Back then they were, I think, again, Ross Perot made it a, a very legitimate issue. A lot of people voted based on that. The fact that President Clinton was able to get through a, a tax increase in 1993 and still get reelected in 1996. And, and in fact, much of his popularity in the second term was based on surpluses. Back then, I think the American people were more focused on it. These days, not really. Um, interest rates are low. People, Republicans want their tax cuts and their, so, and, and their spending, to be honest. Democrats want their spending. Every people today, Sure, lower deficits would be nice, but if you ask people, what would you sacrifice for lower deficits? Would you accept higher taxes or lower benefits? You're not gonna get people in either party who say yes at this point. And you probably won't, to be honest, until the deficit starts to have an effect on their day-to-day -day lives, until interest rates start to rise or the bond market panics. I don't think anything's really gonna make them feel any need to sacrifice like, like they felt a need to 30 years ago. Interesting. Well, and I have one last question from the audience that I'll throw to you, Wendy, because it's kind of related to what we're talking about. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, what are the ways to raise federal revenue that would be the least damaging to the economy? Um, so this kind of gets into what Brian was just talking about. You know, people don't like deficits, but they sure don't want to see the taxes go up or see their benefits go down. So, so go ahead, Wendy, just broad question there. Right. So the way economists generally think about this is that they don't want tax. They, they in some in some cases, they want tax policy to affect people's behavior because they think that tax policy can actually make people act in a more efficient manner, make people act in a in a manner that's that's better for public welfare. So, for example, a carbon tax is often raised, you know, as, as an example of one of these sorts of taxes that when we when we um, buy certain things that are really highly energy intensive, we don't take into account all of the costs of producing that energy um, just because it's not priced into the product. And so let's have a carbon tax that actually makes us internalize that cost a little more. And that can raise a lot of revenue. So it both raises revenue and gets people to act more efficiently. Um, the other thing that you want to do is sometimes you want to raise taxes in a way that doesn't change people's behavior because you think people are acting efficiently. They're doing all the right things. You just need to raise revenue. And you, so you want to do that in a way that, that does as has as little effect on people's behavior as possible. And there we have a phrase where we call it broadening the base. Basically, what we want is we want to raise, um, we want to, I, I'm trying not to use technical terms. Uh, we, we basically want to raise the, your average tax rate in a way where you're not really thinking about it while you make each individual last decision. It's basically just acting in the background. It's like what kind of happens on average. And it's not the, but do I want to work one more hour? But do mm. I want to invest that one extra dollar? And so we have ways of raising taxes that do more of that thing where it's just like happening in the background and not affecting every last marginal decision. And we have a lot of ideas on the shelf that we can take down that raise taxes in that way that have the smallest effect on people's behavior possible. So you want to do big effects on people's behavior where it makes people act more efficiently and better for social welfare and other ways of raising taxes that raise a lot of money, but don't affect people's behavior. Well, hard to believe we've almost run out of time. And I did want to ask you one last question. And uh, Wendy, to you first, please. What would you consider a healthy level of debt and how likely are we to achieve it? So we talked earlier about, you know, it's around, depending how you measure it, anywhere from 20 yep. to 30 million. What would be a, a more comfortable level for you, Wendy? I just have to say it's 20 or 30 trillion. <laughs> not even billion, definitely not million. <laughs> um, so I am so glad to get that question because it allows me to give the answer that there really is no tipping point. We actually have no idea uh, what too much debt looks like. Uh, we know that too much debt is when financial markets get scared and interest rates spike or the value of the dollar plummets. We know 
that's when things have gone awry. And even under all of the scary current law projections that Brian was talking about, uh, financial markets are not particularly perturbed. So a healthy debt is one that we can make interest payments on without particularly worrying about financing those interest payments. Now, right now that's about 100% of GDP. Um, it probably is true at 150% of GDP. And for all I know, it may well be true at 200% of GDP. It matters what interest rates are. It matters how the big our economy is. Um, and it matters how much we're borrowing from ourselves and how much we're borrowing from abroad. So um, there's unfortunately, and this is so frustrating to policymakers who really want to know the answer to the question that you just asked. There is no number that I can give. Wow. Well, Brian, what do you think? Is there a number? Would the healthiest level of debt be no debt at all? Would it being a creditor nation be the best situation for the United States? I'd love your thoughts on this too, Brian. Well, I, th I think, I mean, I, I don't think being a creditor nation uh, would, would be that great. I think there are some things you want to go into debt for. And in fact, studies show that a modest amount of debts actually increase economic growth at, at the lower levels because the, you need the investment. And frankly, the Federal Reserve needs a certain degree of debt to do monetary policy to buy and sell bonds. In terms of what's healthy, I agree there's no tipping point. I think if one of the things we look at is how much do we have to spend on interest costs, then really the sustainable level also depends on what interest rates are. The higher interest rates go, the lower the sustainable debt level is in order to have a certain amount of money spent on interest. So, you know, if some will say we should, you know, we shouldn't be spending more than say 3% of GDP on interest or 4% of GDP on interest. Otherwise we would have to start raising taxes or cutting other programs. Then it just kind of becomes matching up the interest rate with the debt level. What concerns me is that the debt level is, is, you know, again, headed in such a steep increase to, you know, 200% of GDP or really more if Congress gets busy in 30 years, you really start to need interest rates to be one or 2% in order to keep interest levels uh, low when the debt gets that big. And so I would like, I would like to see Congress try to stabilize the debt somewhere in hundred, I would like them to try to stabilize it closer to 100% of GDP, maybe 150% of GDP. But if it starts going to 200, 250, 300, you need like a 1% interest rates then to keep the, the interest costs around 3% of GDP. So I, I would like to see some action from Congress to try to stabilize things. Well, what a great conversation this has been and what a great way to celebrate 30 years of the Concord Coalition. It seems amazing. I remember myself when the coalition was formed. I want to remind everybody that this webinar is being recorded. Excerpts from today will be broadcast next Wednesday, March 16th from 3 to 4 p.m. on WKXL Radio right here in New Hampshire. And video and audio from the entire webinar will be available online at Concord Coalition. Dot org. I really want to give a big thank you to our panelists for joining us. We've been talking with Brian Beadle of the Manhattan Institute. Brian, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. And also with Wendy Edelberg with the Brookings Institution. Wendy, thank you very much for your insights and thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. It was a lot of fun. I'd also like to thank the Peterson Foundation and you, our audience. Thank you all for being with us.